Okay. And our second point that we're going to preach on is that in becoming what he created, that is, in becoming what Jesus created, because remember, the Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and he is the Creator, if you will. And so in becoming what he created, God proved that since he can live as a man, then man can live as God lives. Amen. Now we're not, we are not God. Nobody is going to be God. But we are supposed to live like him. Got it? This is a very important distinction. I don't want anybody to misunderstand my point. Now, turn to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8, we'll start at verse 3. Now, folks, you're not going to hear this message anywhere but here. And I'm not saying that because I'm smarter or better than anybody else, except that there's so much bad doctrine in the church that says, well, nobody can, nobody's perfect. Nobody can do what God commands. That's not possible. That's the purpose of grace, didn't you know? Come on. Come on. Wake up here, pal. Why do we need grace if men can obey God? Well, remember, grace, if properly studied and interpreted in the Bible, is both undeserved and deserved. The Bible says Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. When Moses is up on top of the mountain with God, this is that Gene mentioned this morning that his church is called Part of the Presence Movement? Uh, presence Driven Church. Presence Driven Church. And they take it from the story of Moses. When God got so angry and frustrated with the people of Israel, He says, I'm not going with you. I'm going to send an angel with you. Remember that story? He's so angry after the golden calf incident. He says, I'm done. I'm finished. <laughs> I, I thought of this this morning. He actually tells Moses, Your people that you brought out of Egypt <laughs> have made this golden calf. I, I'm, I'm had, they're not even my people. They're your people, Moses. You got that? He's so frustrated. He's so angry with these people. So Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. Oh, what? That's what he tells God. If you don't go, I'm not going. I don't want an angel. God says, I'll send an angel with you. I don't want an angel. I want you. That should be your attitude, folks. Don't ever sec settle for second best. We want the best there is. We want God to abide and dwell and live with us. And the people talking about angels. <laughs> you and I were talking about this thing we went to in Rochelle. I, I see angels. And preachers up there, I see angels. I see angels. I said, Gene, I don't see any angel. <laughs> You know, I didn't even stand up. I was sitting in the back. He's kind of like, stand up, stand up. I'm not going to stand up. I'm fear tired. I've been working all day. You know, everybody's up there, I see angels, I see angels. This is years ago. We went to Rochelle. Because a guy from the Brownsville Revival was coming to talk about the Brownsville Revival. And Dean wanted to hear about it. So he got me and Gene and a couple other guys. I was just me and you. And Indeed. We went down to Rochelle to hear this guy talk about the Brownsville Revival. And before the guy got up to speak, the pastor of the church had an angelic revelation that apparently nobody else saw because right. it was only him. Now, folks, when somebody does that, you ought to question it. Because usually when God appears... He, now he, I, I realize even even the voice, the the, the the men that worked with Paul, remember on the Damascus Road, they heard the voice too. So usually God just doesn't give an appearance to one person. If it's in a group, it's going to be to everybody. So anyway, don't settle for second best. Say God, I want you or nothing. That's what Moses told God. Amen. I want your presence, and so. As God said, okay, since, I, since you have found favor with me, and I know you, I call you by your name, I'll go with you. So grace can be deserved because Moses was God's man. The book of Hebrews says Moses was faithful 
in all God's house. That's what it says. He was faithful in all God's house. And so God said, I'll go with you, Moses, just because you asked me to go. Amen? So we need to be, that's what we need to be. Uh, grace, grace to the believer is deserved. We really are holy and righteous. We really are the sons and daughters of the living God. And you, your children, who are your children, you don't, you don't feed them because they don't deserve it. You feed them because they're your children. You love them and they deserve to be fed. Amen? <laughs> I don't know any parents says, well, you don't deserve this meal, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I'm gracious. Gracious. You look at them like, what's the matter with you? They're your child. Amen? So, Romans chapter, sorry, I got off on that. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, weak, and this is a voluntary weakness, or a choosing to give an ear to the desires of the flesh. It's not a, what we call an inherent weakness, or an, a, a built-in weakness. It's a voluntary weakness. As it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus had the exact same physical body that all of us have. You understand that? It, he didn't have some other kind of body. He had the same physical desire. And by the way, when the Bible speaks of flesh, it's not talking about your skin. It's talking about the appetites, the desires, the, the things that the flesh craves. You know, sleep, food, power. Wealth, these are all... By the way, God made all those things, didn't He? God designed us that way. This, is, this didn't come from the devil. These are all natural things that are built into man. So the desires of the flesh are good. They are all intended for good purposes. The problem is they get corrupted and they become the most important thing in our life instead of in the proper order that they ought to be in. Amen? God first and others second, and then the desires that we have all fall somewhere down below that. This is a very important concept. So, Paul says that Jesus was came in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. I think the King James says, and as sin. But Jesus never sinned. He is a sin offering. He, Jesus, condemned sin in the flesh. So this is a very important point of the Incarnation. If God could come down and live as a man, then man's, man can live as God lives. Be ye holy as I am holy, the Bible commands. Verse 4, So that the requirement of the law, which is what? What does the law require? <laughs> Obedience. <laughs> That's all the law requires. Very simple. Obey me. That's it. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. This, I, you know, it's amazing to me. These people, they get up in pulpits every Sunday and say, well, nobody can obey God. It's impossible. Don't even try. You can't do it. And yet Paul says right here that Jesus came that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who? Who walk not according to the flesh, the desires, the appetites, the passions, but according to the Spirit. Now, this is not some kind of do, 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 do. This is just get up every day and do what's right. That's walking according to the that's, Spirit that's of God. That's obedience. That's walking according to the Spirit. That's it. Obedience. That's if it. If you don't obey, right. we have a part in it. That's right. And by the way, this word Spirit is speaking of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, but it also can apply to the Spirit of the law. What is the Spirit of the law? Love. That's all. All the Spirit of the law is love. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul even reduces it down to one word. Love, therefore, he says, fulfills the law. That's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And what God's concerned about is you fulfilling the spirit of the law of God. That's the most important thing. And that's what the Holy Spirit 
does or it intends to do in our lives is to bring about spiritual compliance, not legalistic compliance. God's not interested in, you know, how many biscuits you eat for breakfast. I only had three and I could have had four, so I... No, no, no. He wants you to do what's loving, what's good, what's right. Keep the spirit of the law. Amen? Amen. Jesus broke the Sabbath to keep the spirit. He broke the letter of the law to keep the spirit of the law. He healed on the Sabbath, which, of course, the, Bible, the Old Testament never prohibits doing good on the Sabbath, just that the Pharisees had come up with all these traditions that they said was wrong. So, anyway. Now, the name uh, for Jesus that is most often used at Christmas is Emmanuel. Isn't that right? Which means God with us. That's a, this preposition, with, is a very important preposition, isn't it? With means beside, within. We even use the term within. God with us. Now this is not the first time God dwelt on earth, is it? For he lived in the tabernacle first, and then the temple for about 890 years. He actually dwelled in these two places, and how do we know he was there? There was a pillar of fire at night, and there was a pillar of, of cloud up by the day uh, in the ta over the tabernacle while the people were in the wilderness. And then the presence of God, when Solomon built a temple, it says that the uh, priests couldn't even go in there. They had to, they had to go out of there. And, uh, you know, they, they would put uh, incense each day. They put showbread, fresh bread on the table every day. They had, all, they had burnt offerings that they did every morning and every evening. And, of course, God would display Himself from time to time. And so, uh, God's presence was among men. Now, He lived on earth in, at that time in His spiritual essence, we would say. Uh, men didn't actually see a form when they went into the temple. They just felt His presence or sensed His presence while He was there. Now, if God desired to appear to men, they, He would hide Himself in humanity. He would appear as a man. We call those theophanies or Christophanies. If Christ appeared, the second person appeared, He would appear as a man. Remember, Jacob wrestled, and we know, we know it wasn't a, a Casper the friendly ghost. Why, how do we know that in the story of Jacob? The guy says, let go of me. <laughs> let go of me. Well, that, you know, you don't say that if you're kidding around. Jacob was a, he must have been a quite a guy. And he, by the way, he wasn't any kid there. He was like 81 years old when they're 90, he was 91 years old because Joseph already him. He was an old geezer. But he gets a hold of God out there and God says, finally, this theophany says, hey, let go of me. He says, I won't let go until you give me a blessing. Oh, man, that's what you need to do. Sorry, Joyce. <laughs> Don't let go. Don't let go until God gives you a blessing. You hang on to God. So why do we have to hang on? God wants to find out how serious you are about it. You know that? So many Christians are like a little kid. I want it. I want it. Please, oh, come on. I want it. Can't you give it to me? Please, please, please. Like little Caleb. Oh, yeah, I want this. I want this. He's got a 15... Part list for Christmas. Five hundred dollars. That's just the minimum list. <laughs> a lot of Christians are like, hey, it's going. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, a lot of Christians. That's the way they are. They just, I want, I want, I want. God says, oh, let's find out how serious you are. And by the next morning, they they forgot completely. Oh no, folks, you got to be like Jacob. You got to get a hold of God and say, I'm not letting go. I don't care if it's tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. I'm not letting go till I get a blessing from you, God. Hey, if more Christians would do that, they'd get a blessing. Mm -hmm. I've been studying the Bible since I got saved very faithfully. One might say I've been hanging on to God by getting into the Word of God and studying, thinking, meditating, going through it over and over and over again. 
because I'm pretty thick skull, folks, to be honest. I'm not that bright, but I'm a bulldog. I get a hold of something I'm not letting go. I'm going to keep right after it. That's, what you, that's the attitude you got to have in this world. You can't be one of these flighty, flippant people. So, he would, God would come down. Now, the unique aspect of Christmas is that God just didn't appear as a man. He became a man. We sang in the, one of the Christmas carols that he was begotten of God. Remember, he's the only begotten son, not created. Notice, the Bible doesn't say Jesus was created like all... All the rest of us are created right. at the moment of conception. We didn't exist before that. Everybody got that? But Jesus was begotten because He existed beforehand. I'm getting ahead of myself. Can you right explain here. begotten? It means yeah, He was... I think I know. Okay. In essence, it means that God sent Him into the world as a man, in a, in a form of a man. He already existed. But he already existed. He's, he's uncreated. He is the eternal, infinite God. But now a lot of people believe that Jesus was created. Go ahead, Dave. His physical body didn't exist. Right. That's all. But none of our physical bodies existed either. There's no such thing as... In, in humanity, there's no such thing as pre-existent. Not you've got this. You got to get away from all this Eastern mysticism, reincarnation, all this kind of hogwash. None of us existed physically or spiritually before our conception, but Jesus existed, if you will, spiritually, because God. Jesus said, "God is a spirit." Remember, that's what He told the woman at the well. So the second person of the Trinity was a spiritual being. Until the moment that Mary said, Be it done unto me according to your word. And at that instant, I believe, the second person of the Trinity left heaven and was inserted into a little ovum in Mary's womb. And Jesus began to develop. That's the beginning of the man. Christ Jesus, but not the beginning of the Son of the living God, because He always existed. You know, I hope you understand be, between begotten and created. We are all created at the moment of conception. We, no matter what anybody tells you, you did not exist before the instant that you're, you're, there was a, a, a conception. Got it? So has Jesus been around as long as God has been around? Of course, He is God. He and is, the Holy Spirit, they were all... They're all God. God. They all three existed before there was ever one angel. They existed together in a loving relationship. They, they, they had lots to talk about as, as wonderful, three wonderful beings. And then they decided to create angelic beings at some point in, in this infinite timeline, they decided to create angelic beings. But what, by the way, someone says, well, why? Why did they wait so long? Well, I don't know why. We'll have to ask them that. But, you know, after a while, they said, you know, it's not fair that we should just keep this among ourselves. It's so wonderful that this love that we have, this is so great. Let's, let's make some beings that we can share ourselves with. So they made the angels. Amen. Yes. But when Jesus came, we have to remember that he did not <clears throat> come here as God... <coughs> He, became, he came here as man, and he had to learn, and he was very intelligent, of course, but it, he, I came to realize not too long ago that he had to pray so much because he was learning from God. He was talking to God and learning what he should be doing and That's saying. Right. He's preaching my sermon for me. Keep going, brother. That's what I'm going to talk about. You remember the body. Come on, keep going. No, you, it's really you it's exa he just took my notes right out of here. <laughs> he began as a baby. He had grew up to be a toddler, an adolescent, a teenager. And when he came here, he gave up all his memories. Jesus did not remember his life before he became a man. Now, how could he know about it? Well, he could read the Scriptures, right? In other words, he knew he was the Creator and knew what happened because he read the Scriptures. And, of course, the Holy Spirit could reveal to him certain things. But remember, he's a man, just like we are a man. Let's, uh, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5. Go ahead, Gene. He doesn't, know, he doesn't quite agree with me on that, but go ahead. No. Oh, okay. No. Uh, I, I think, though, that uh, Mary probably told him. 
Oh yes, his parents told him. Right. The scriptures told him. The right. Holy Spirit told him. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, his parents were the biggest factor in that. Go ahead, Bill. But even so, can you imagine the amount of faith it took him yes. to realize uh -huh. what his destiny was? Yes. As a human being, yep. he had to come to some really conclusions that were just Absolutely. something else. Well, let's read about them. Hebrews 5, verse 5. Hebrews 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he, the Father, who said to him, the Son, it's important when you read the Bible, you know, make a little note with your pencil, F and S for Father and Son. You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. There's the term, Megan. I have begotten you just as he also says in another passage, you, are you the son, are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It's quoting from David in the Psalms. In the days of his flesh, speaking of when Jesus was here on earth as living as a man on earth, unresurrected body, he offered up both prayers and supplications. Uh, John's talking, that's what John's talking about. He spent so much time in prayer with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Oh, Jesus was just paranoid, right? <laughs> Did Jesus have good reason to ask to be saved from death? Oh, yeah, they were trying to kill him all the time. They constantly. He had assassins. He had a, he had a, he had a contract on his head his entire ministry. And they were trying... Actually, it started before he was... Just yeah. as soon he was born, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. right. Herod sent a bunch of soldiers down to Bethlehem and slaughtered all the babies two years and under. Now, of course, he wasn't praying about it then because he didn't realize what was going on. But as an adult, his, oh, by the way, his parents certainly told him that story. Yeah. You can bet on that. He heard that story every year, probably on his birthday. How the, if God hadn't, the angel hadn't come to Joseph and gotten him out of there, he'd have, he'd have been killed. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So it says, the one able to save him from death, back to Hebrews, and he was heard. Oh, that's great. When was he heard? Well, he did die, didn't he? So it couldn't apply to the cross. It had to apply specifically to the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. Remember that? By the way, what was the physical manifestation of his grief that night? Great drops of blood. Now, I've read a medical journal that said his blood pressure had to be above 250 on the bottom number to pop the capillaries under the skin. Now, someone says, well, he didn't want to go to the cross. No, 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 no. That's not the issue at all. Jesus was fearful that he would die before he got to the cross. He tells his disciples, I am grieved unto death right now. So he prayed, don't let me die here. Now, someone said, well, why was Jesus grieved? Because in rejecting the Son, they had rejected the Father. The Father. Jesus said over and over again in his ministry, I'm not here for myself. I didn't even come on my own initiative. The Father sent me. And he said, I love the Father and the Father loves me. He said, "If you, I came here to show the Father. That's what, isn't that what John said? He, he, has, he, said, he, he came in the flesh to explain Him to the people of Israel. So He offered up both prayers and supplications to Him who was able to save Him. Death, and He was heard because He, the King, I like the King James better, because He feared. Who did He fear? He feared God. Read Isaiah." Twice there it says that Jesus was full of the fear of God. He feared his Father as well as loved him. we got this all messed up in our church today. All this love, love, love. Unconditional love, love, love. Jesus feared God. He was heard because of his piety. feared. Although he was a son. Let's get this. This one always is tough for these folks. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus didn't have an easy life on earth, did he? Just as a boy, imagine. They all mocked and ridiculed him as being a bastard child. 
Remember that? Crying out loud. Yeah. You're, you're just a bastard. Can you imagine growing up with that hanging over your head. I hit him in the back. Yeah. I finally had to call him out. There's yeah. another one down there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he suffered greatly, and that's how he learned to put his faith in God, to put faith in his Father. Jesus had to go through the same process we have to go through, folks. Don't get this idea that Jesus just did, you know, always just fell in place. You know, it's interesting at the uh, at Transfiguration. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> and having been made perfect, get that phrase? That's folks, that's one of the most important statements about the Lord Jesus. He wasn't born perfect. He was made perfect voluntarily. Nobody can be holy unless they make a choice to be holy. You got that? Now, Jesus was innocent. The Bible very clearly states that He never sinned. Not once. So He was as innocent as Benny Boy. Got it? He did. He, nobody could make any comments about Jesus' innocence. And by the way, remember I said initially in this sermon that's important because if He's going to be an atonement, the Old Testament animals were innocent animals. So Jesus Himself, if He was going to be an atonement, had to be innocent as well as holy by choice. And this verse says He was made perfect. And because He was, He became to all those who... And I love it better. <laughs> obey Him. New American Standard. Oh, King James says believe, but the New American Standard says obey Him. Someone says, well, well, how can they do that? Well, turn to John 3.36. Just real quick. I'm, I'm, we're not going to get through this today. This is the tragedy of my preaching. I can't ever stay on. John 3.36. This is a great, important verse. And it, it, this, this is the right way. Now, it, it reads two ways in the King James, but let me read it in the New American Standard. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son, now King James says does not believe, but the proper rendering of that is does not obey the Son, will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So Jesus became the source of salvation to all those who obey Him. Amen. Now people say, oh, you're making salvation conditional. Right. You bet your sweet bippy I'm making it conditional. Who, who was the bippy guy? We were talking about Flip Wilson this morning. The devil, you know, the church followed Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Isn't that right? That's really the church. They didn't follow Jesus Christ. They followed that dumb comedian. The devil made me do it. All right, now, the key doctrine in my point this morning is the humanity of Jesus. Now, Orthodox theology, which, by the way, you don't want to be call yourself Orthodox, <laughs> because in many cases, the Orthodoxy, remember, the, the Pharisees were the Orthodoxy of Jesus' day, weren't they? And Jesus, he gives them all these woes. So, most orthodox theology is not even biblical, if you really examine it. So, the, the idea of orthodox is that Jesus was like man, except in the area that he, was, he couldn't sin. It was not possible for Jesus to sin, because they believed he actually existed on earth as God, not as a man. But the Bible clearly states that Jesus was tempted in every point as we are, yet Amen. without Amen. sin. Amen. Now, that verse proves that Jesus didn't live here as God, doesn't it? Why? God cannot be tempted. Right. But what, what? God's not tempted. That's right. James says God cannot be tempted with evil. So if Jesus lived on earth as God, he could not have been tempted. And the Bible is basically falsifying itself. You understand this? So the only way Jesus could have been tempted is if he lived on earth as a man, just like you and me. And he did not live here as God. He did not use his divine powers. And Dean goes through all this in the temptation of Jesus. If you'll notice, Jesus is tempted by the devil to do what? 
To have sex with a woman? Yeah, absolutely. No, he was not. What did what did what Satan tempt Jesus to do? Oh, oh yeah, jump off. Well, first of all, he said, Test God. you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. Now, folks, I don't care how hungry you are, you can, you can point at the stone your whole life and you can't turn it into bread. But Jesus could have. But he would, it would have required him picking up his divinity, taking up his divine nature, and turning the stones into bread. Secondly, he says... Uh, took him up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast yourself off. And Satan quotes the scripture. and says, an angel shall come down and, and lest thy, and dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus rebukes Satan and says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. You know, you... And then, of course, the last one is, you fall down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms. You don't, just make a shortcut here. You don't need to go through all this to get the kingdoms of the world. So in every point, Satan tempted Jesus to pick up his divinity to make his life as a man easier than you and me. But Jesus in every time said, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to live here as a man. Got that? So he didn't. Satan doesn't say, I'll give you the riches of the world. Uh, he, he doesn't tempt him with what a, we would think a normal human would be, but he's tempted as God to pick up his divinity. Go ahead, Chuck. He referred himself as the Son of Man. Always. Because he was, by the way. I mean, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't faking anything or hiding anything. He was a man. Now, he also was God. But remember, they, the Pharisees, they kept wanting him to say it. Go ahead, say it. Do dare you say it. Say it. And Jesus, finally, he does say, well, you've said it. He does, but he, Jesus never really makes a big deal about this because he wants everybody to understand, I'm here as a man. That ought to be encouraging to you, dear friends, because if Jesus can do it, you can do it. That's my point. So the humanity of Jesus is so important. Now this truth makes Jesus the only pre-existing person ever born of a woman. We must recognize him as our God and his word as the law. In other words, Dean Harvey always said, Jesus came to put a face on the law. Remember that? I'll never forget that. And so often we think of the law as some kind of an impersonal thing. But when you look at Jesus, remember he, he was very personal. He said things like, you have heard it said this, but I say unto you this. And he told his disciples, at the Last Supper, you know, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right? He called them my commandments. And everywhere, Jesus commanded his disciples to do things, didn't he? If we're his disciples, those commands apply to us today also. So, uh, he's our God. Now, turn to John chapter 1. Turn to John chapter 1, Gospel of John, we we'll start at verse 15. Now this is kind of John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. This is very important. Now remember, Jesus and John are first cousins. But apparently they did not grow up together because John says, I didn't recognize him as, you know, as, he said, I didn't recognize him. So they, they weren't close like some cousins are. They I got cousins I've never met. I wouldn't know who they were if I, you know. So they, they, didn't, they didn't grow up together, if you will. Here's what John says, verse 15. John testified about him, Jesus, and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. But who was older? John. John, John the Baptist was older. So he means Jesus pre-existed before him. <clears throat> Verse 16, For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Of course, John's the Baptist is recognizing him as the Messiah. The, the word Christ means anointed one. It refers to the Messiah, the one that's coming. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. So, Jesus came to explain the Father. 
And he even said, if you, he tells Philip at the Last Supper, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Come on, Philip, what's the matter with you? He's, God, Jesus was kind of distressed there. I think he's like, come on, don't you get it? And we all, I think many of us have this idea that, that the Father is some other being other than Jesus in terms of who they, their, their character. Now, they're two distinct people. They're not the same person. Don't anybody get the wrong idea here. It's just that they're, their characters are alike. They have the same righteous character. So if you've seen the character of Jesus, you've seen the character of the Father. He came to put Him on display. Everything that we see in Jesus is true about the Father. Amen? Even when He drove the money changers out of the temple. We often want to think of the, the nice, the kind things, but Jesus was a He-Man, folks. You got no whim. Have you ever tried to... Staying up all night praying. I don't mean I'm not talking about falling asleep every five minutes, but Jesus made a habit of spending all night praying, often, and he fasted often too. Amen. Amen. Uh, so he lived without sin as a man and never used his powers as God to make his make outcomes or circumstances or temptations different than ours. So. But when the Bible says he was tempted in every point as we are, it's true. And by the way, when the Satan left him after his temptation in the wilderness, it doesn't say that was the end of his temptations. It says, and he waited for a more opportune time. <laughs> yeah. So Jesus didn't just go through the big three and then, okay, whew, oh man, okay, it's no, no sweat now, it's all downhill. Oh no. Satan kept it up. Got it? It's very important for us to understand. Now, oh good. Um, we've already discussed that uh, Jesus you know, lived uh, as a, a man. Now let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. Let's see one of the reasons Jesus came. Okay, there's a couple of reasons here. Remember he tells Pilate, I came to testify to the truth. One says, well, the truth about what? Well, we could say generally about truth in general, the truth about God, the truth about man, the truth about sin, the truth about righteousness. But remember, Pilate specifically asks Jesus, are you a king? Remember that? And Jesus says to Pilate, well, are you doing this on your own or did somebody put you up to this? Pilate gets kind of irritated. He says, I'm not a Jew. You know, what, what do you, who do you think I am? And Jesus says, well, you say rightly I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting. But my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. Where does it exist? In your heart. In my heart. That's where it exists. It doesn't exist out there somewhere. The kingdom of God is within you, the Bible says. Paul says the kingdom of God is eating and drinking and righteousness and peace, peace of the Holy Spirit. Peace and joy. Peace and joy, yeah. That, that, that's what the kingdom of God is. It, it's within us. And Jesus didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. Now, he is going to ultimately, isn't he? The kingdom of God is going to come upon this earth at some point. Where our Sunday school lesson was, about, part, was partly about that. All right, 1 John chapter 3, we'll start at verse 7. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Now, whenever you read that in the Bible, you know for certain that people have been deceived about the subject that he's going to be talking about. You know, in other words, that's written as a preface. Chapter 3, verse 7. That's written as a preface to warn people that what's coming is to correct a deception that has already come into the church. Otherwise, there's no, if there's no deception, there's no, read, no need to read, make sure no one deceives you. Got that? Remember, this: when you read the Bible, use common sense. Uh, the one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he. Who's he? Jesus. Remember what the point of this sermon is. Jesus became a man, God became a man, to show men that they could live like God. Right? So that's what Jesus is saying here. Or that's what John is saying here. 
He who practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus is righteous. By the way, how was Jesus righteous? By choice. Isn't that right? He just made a choice to do what's right. The word righteous just means to do what's right. That's all it means. It's not some kind of hocus-pocus word. You don't have to go up on top of a mountain, Daniel, and sit for two years contemplating the stars to be righteous. You just got to get up every day and do what's right. It's real simple. It's not complicated. And how do you know what's right? Well, your conscience tells you what's right and what's wrong. God put it there. And the Bible says the law is written on our hearts. So nobody can say, well, I, I, you know, my conscience. No, your problem is most people don't listen to their conscience. How do we know that? Well, because Jiminy Cricket sang a little song, right? About your conscience. No, we know it because it's built into us. We don't have to watch Pinocchio to figure out that we've got a conscience. We all know it. And it bears witness uh, either for or against us, doesn't it? Our choices that we make, our actions. Now, verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. To destroy the works of the devil. Which is what? Sin. God wants to destroy sin in us. You get that? This is not some... Here's sin, and I'm going to stomp on it and destroy it. No, sin is a choice that we make to serve ourselves rather than serve God. It's a choice based upon a motive of self-supremacy instead of the supremacy of God. It's a wrong motive of heart. That's what sin is. But it's a choice. You've got to make a choice. And the willing, by the way, is the doing. You don't have to have the outward act of it. You just have to make the choice in your heart, if you will, or in your mind. And so Jesus came to destroy sin in us. Well, how does He do that? Well, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us, and we're encouraged, and we're, you know, we're uh, influenced. God uses all kinds of persuasion. Love's a great persuader, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure to your faith that when David told you he loved you, that was a big persuasion, wasn't it? Because you, you probably had some other guys that told you that they loved you, but Dave said, well, I love you, Faith. It's a great, love's a great persuader, folks. And God, the Bible says we love Him. Why? Because we first loved Him? No, because He first loved us. So the Holy Ghost comes in to persuade us by love. Depart from our life of selfishness. I want you to be happy. By the way, Gordon always used to write on the board all the time, holiness equals happiness. Why does God demand that we be holy? Because He wants us to be happy. Jordan, if you want to be happy, don't sin. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Sin has a terrible thing. It's called guilt, folks. If you've never experienced it, thank God. Because I'll tell you, more people kill themselves because of guilt than any other reason. That's right. We have a billion dollar industry called psychiatry today. You know why? Guilt. I'll never forget Carl Menninger wrote a book entitled Whatever Became of Sin. If you've never read, you ought to get it. I think it's yeah. still probably around. Whatever Became of Sin, Carl Menninger. From the Menninger Clinic in Wichita, Kansas. And in essence, he said, this is the whole problem. Psychiatry's gotten rid of sin. You know? And by the way, you can't just hide it under the bushel, folks. All you have to do is follow the money. Right? Yeah, yeah, follow the money. They want it. They want you to. They want you to keep. By the way, if you get rid of, if you get saved and get forgiveness, you don't need a psychiatrist. You don't need the pills Amen. anymore, do you? Amen. 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 So it, it pays for them to just keep the thing going. <laughs> so a psychiatrist has gotten rid of talking about sin, but the issue is stop sinning. Right. And put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. Amen. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, that is, in sin. Lost in sin. Yes, John? I think when you lose your ability to discover or know what's right and wrong, you become insane. Yes. That's right. That's right. 
Look at verse 9 here. We'll, we'll, we'll close with verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin. Well, it doesn't mean you can't. You don't want to. You'll get the word, what's, what's the word practice mean? It's something that's repetitious, isn't it? You do it over and over. Now, Caleb, I was bragging about my little grandson. I'll bet he folds 50 paper airplanes a day. <laughs> my house, I, got, I find them everywhere. Behind the furniture. All over the floor. The yard, I bet there's 10 of them in the yard. Now, Megan's house, there's probably five or 600 in her house. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. He'll go through a ream of paper. I bet I throw 50 away every day. Yeah, yeah. Crack, and now he's making up his own designs. You know, he isn't going just by the guy on the internet that he watches. He makes up his own designs now. Practice. He does it over and over and over again. Now the Bible says we're to practice holiness over and over and over again. To practice righteousness over. In other words, every time you're faced with a choice, you say, well, I'm going to do what's right. Amen? It's, just, it's real simple. I'm going to do what's right. And, of course, the motive is because I want to please God. I want Him happy. And when we do what's right, He's happy. And that ought to make us happy. Just like I, lo I love my grandsons. I want to make them happy. So once in a while I yell at them. I haven't swatted them in a long time, but I would. <laughs> because I want them to be happy. Amen? Sometimes God's got to swat us. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, He chastises. Because He loves us. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen? Amen. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you living in a manner worthy of the Son of God? The man, Christ Jesus? Because let me tell you something, folks. Jesus ain't never going back. When he came, became a man, he's never going back to being what he was before. Someone says, well, how do you know that? Because in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, Paul tells the people at Athens that God is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man, having furnished proof of it by raising him from the dead. So Jesus gave up Folks, well, you, we, it's inconceivable what Jesus gave us when he left heaven. And who, what did he do it for? Well, he did it primarily for the Father, but he also, we get the benefit, he did it for us. The writer of Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him. That's us. That's you. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down, meaning his work is finished at the right hand of the throne on high. So Jesus came. The joy is for you and me. Don't disappoint Him this Christmas season, my dear friends. Amen. Make sure you're a, a joy to God. Make sure you're a worthy of the name Christian this Amen. year. By the way, Jesus, the word Christ is anointed one. Anointed. The word Christian is anointed one. See, got it? We're the temples of God. We're the anointed ones now. We've taken the name of Christ. You better live up to it. Amen? Amen? Don't you bring shame on the name of Jesus Christ. The serious business, folks. God's not messing around. But we read the verse this morning in Hebrews chapter 10, where the writer says, If someone died without mercy under Moses' law by two or three witnesses, how much severer punishment do you think will fall upon those that trample. trample underfoot the blood of the new covenant? And consider Jesus, ah, it's not a big deal. His death is not a big deal. Jesus died, you know, this, don't you ever say this. Jesus died for all my sins, past, mm. present, mm -hmm. and future. Oh no, friends. When you come to the cross, you give up your life of sin. This is what John's saying. He who has the seed of God cannot, that not, means it's not morally possible, you just don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Say, I don't want to sin. 
Because Jesus came as a little baby in a manger 2,000 years ago and died on the cross that I can be set free. Sorry, Joyce. <laughs> Amen? Amen? She's watching me. <laughs> Anybody got anything to say in closing? Get that. I know you do, Dave. Please. Well, in First John, if you keep on reading, it's interesting. God has made a way that we may know who are the children of God and who are the children of Read the devil. It. Yep. This is verse ten it says, "By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Mm -hmm. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God." nor the one who does not love his brother. Right. So it's not the church you attend. Right. It's not your profession of faith. Mm -hmm. It's not because right. you say you're right. a Christian. It's not because of your theology. It's what you do. Right. If you practice sin, you're not of God right. and you're not a Christian. Nope. If you practice righteousness, you are of God. You're born of God. Amen. And this is how we will know. That's right. Which is interesting, because how, what does everyone say? Don't judge. Right, right. But we are, to, it is obvious to us by what you do, how you live, what it is that you practice, that we will know who is the Amen. child of God. Amen. Well, this is an important thing. You know, so, so well, how do I know? Well, here's how you know. Go ahead, John. That's not what you hear from the modern church. No. They say you can't, you can't help but sin. Yeah. Well... Don't you believe it? It isn't so. If it is so, then the Bible's not true, folks. The Bible's not true of what they say. Amen? Amen. Well, next Sunday we'll, I don't know what we'll do. I mean, I've got two more points. I'll never get through them. But we're going to talk again about the incarnation and the condescension. Now, girls, would one of you ladies get ready to read the Christmas story like you did last year? I don't care whichever one of you wants to read it. I'd like you to read it next Sunday. Next Sunday, the story of Christmas. You ought to read it this week several times if you can. It's a great story. By the way, it's not just a story. I should say account. It's a historically accurate account of the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen? It really happened. Father, we thank you this morning for your many blessings to us. We're grateful for truth, for the Bible. Oh, God, you're so great. How is it that men don't just love you? You're so lovable. There's nothing about you that's unlovely. Mm -hmm. And we love you. We're going to serve you. We're sorry that so many Christians are such poor examples. But it's our prayer that we can make up for that by living holy lives in this world. We pray that your spirit would go with us now and we... Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, go over to the Lander Homes.